Aloha Kako, mahalo, mahalo nui for joining us today. I know we still have some um, attendees joining us, but I want to go ahead and get started so we can keep to time. My name is Brianna Govea. I'm the program specialist at the King Kamehameha V Judiciary History Center. On behalf of the center and our two programming partners, the Ululehua Scholars Program and Historic Hawaii Foundation, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this special event. While the remarks shared tonight don't necessarily represent opinions of the judiciary, I'd like to thank Chief Justice Mark Rechtenwald, the Hawaii State Judiciary, and the legislature for their continued support of our mission. As I mentioned, the Judiciary History Center was supported by two great organizations to help, this, to help make this event possible. The Ululehua Scholars Program was established in 1974 at the William S. Richardson School of Law to make legal education accessible to members of Hawaii's diverse communities. Lehua scholars are committed to social justice and service to underserved and disadvantaged communities. The Historic Hawaii Foundation is a statewide nonprofit that helps people save historic places, sites that tell the stories of Hawaii's multi-layered history. And HHF does this through education, advocacy, and the assistance and protection of historic places. Today, we celebrate one of these historic places, beloved island Koho'olawe. This Friday will, will mark 27 years since conveyance of the island transferred from the United States Navy to the state of Hawaii through the Koho'olawe Island Reserve Commission. Our presenters tonight are three individuals intimately connected to Koho'olawe, having spent many years and some decades directly involved in the legal, political, and cultural events we'll learn about in a few minutes. Some quick housekeeping before I introduce our distinguished guests. When the presentations are done, we'll close the program with a Q&A with our Zoom audience. Uh, I encourage you to use the Q&A box at the bottom of your webinar screens to submit questions or comments at any point during the program. And a friendly reminder that this webinar is being recorded and it'll be posted on the Judiciary History Center's um, website and Facebook, as well as Historic Hawaii Foundation's YouTube channels and websites. As I speak, we're also live streaming to HHF's YouTube and Facebook pages. Um, those links are in the chat and the recording will be published immediately after our program ends tonight. Now, finally, the moment we've all been eagerly awaiting Kicking off the presentations tonight is Dr. Deviana Polmaika'i McGregor, educator and author and member of the Protect Koho'olawe Ohana. She's also director of the Center for Oral History at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Deviana has been a member of the Protect Koho'olawe Ohana since its founding in 1976, overseeing cleanup and restoration projects and coordinating cultural fieldwork on the island. In addition to her work at Koholawe, she's director of the Moloka'i Land Trust, which seeks to protect and restore the island's natural and cultural resources and to perpetuate Moloka'i's unique Native Hawaiian traditions. Our second presenter is Stanton Enomoto, who has spent nearly the entirety of his 30 year career in public service, focusing on environmental, natural and cultural resource management planning and Native Hawaiian issues. He currently serves as the Senior Program Director for the U.S. Department of the Interior's Office of Native Hawaiian Relations. Stanton worked for the Koho'olawe Island Reserve Commission from 1995 to 2004 during the Navy's Unexploded Ordnance Clearance Project and overseeing the transfer of access control to the state of Hawaii. And our third speaker is Michael Naho'opi'i, the Executive Director of the Koho'olawe Island Reserve Commission. Michael has been a longtime Protect Koho'olawe Ohana member and has also served as the former U.S. Navy officer in charge of Koho'olawe during the island's conveyance to the state. During the first years of cleanup on Koho'olawe, Michael was the senior manager of the early model cleanup and the later Navy and Unexploded Ordnance Clearance Project. So please join me in welcoming our esteemed speakers. Um, you all can turn your cameras on briefly to say hello to everyone. And Daviana, begin and share your screen whenever you're ready. Cool. 
kulu ka ivi o ka aina, ailana kohe malama lama, ho o hiki ke a moku ya kana loa, a kua ka moana ili, moana ili, ho o ho o hiki ke a loha no ke ia aina e. Aloha kamano na kupuna. Aloha, that is um, the first verse in a chant that was given to us from Uncle Harry Mitchell, who learned it from his kupuna, the Oli Kuhohonu Okaho Olave, and it speaks about the different islands features. Uh, <clears throat> okay, I'm trying to uh, forward this, okay. Um, so the island of Koholabe is shaped like a fetus. And according to traditional histories, the island is the child of Maui and connected by an undersea ridge like an umbilical cord to the island. Chants of origin place um, the uh, parents of Koholawe as Wakea Kahiko Luamea and Papahanao Moku. And in the chants, uh, many of the chants speak of the island being born of fledgling, he punua, a fledgling, he nai a, a porpoise. Uh, all associated with various Kanaloa forms or ocean forms. The island of Molokini is said to be the afterbirth after the island of Koholawe was born. And Pelehonuamea is also associated with the island. Some chants say that she brought the ocean to, Kana, to Kanaloa Koholawe. Um, and at Lua, um, there is the Lua o Kamoho Li'i at Kanapo Bay, which is associated with the navigator brother of Pele uh, Kamoho Ali'i, the, the, the kind of the Ali'i of the sharks. <clears throat> the island has several names. Traditionally, we know it now as Koholawe, which means to be carried away with the currents. It can also mean to take and embrace. But in our research, in our um, oral histories with our kupuna, they informed us that the island was originally named Kanaloa which means um, the, it's named after and dedicated to, as the chant I um, chanted says, was dedicated to Kanaloa, the god of the deep and shallow ocean. This is the view of uh, Koholabe, Kanaloa Koholabe from Ulupalakua, where it looks to be sitting on the, the ocean like a, like a whale, another body form of Kanaloa. And other chants speak of the name of the island as Kohem, Kohe Malamalamo Kanaloa, the shining birth canal of Kanaloa, and others uh, speak of it as Kohe Malamalamo Kanaloa, the southern beacon of Kanaloa, or to the left and lift up like heaven. It is also said to be Kahikimoi, where the sun sets and the spirit goes to rest. The island was home to fishers and farmers, and there are 69 um, Koa, such as this koa in Hakio Aba, uh, which are fishing shrines that mark uh, fishing koa or fishing grounds in the ocean. So speaking to the, the abundance of the ocean and marine resources, you have these 69 fishing shrines right around, like a lay around the island. Um, Kamehameha did bring Koholabe uh, under his rule when he conquered um, Maui Nui and defeated uh, 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 the son of um, Kahikili, uh, whose name is not Kalani Kupule. And, um, and then after the Ainoa or the abolition of the Kapu under Kamehameha II and Kaahumanu, and when Queen Kaahumanu uh, or Prince uh, Chiefess Kaahumanu converted to Christianity, uh, she uh, adopted the Ken Commandments as law and the by one of the punishments for violation of adultery, as well as for conversion to Catholicism was banishment to Koholabe, where there was a prison under the kingdom uh, at Kaulana. The island began to enter into commercial development with goat ranching, sheep ranching, and eventually cattle ranching. These are photos of um, Angus McPhee's uh, cattle ranch operations at Kuheia. And all of the ranching, the, the goats, the sheep, the cattle uh, led to severe erosion. Uh, it said that from 10 to 12 feet of uh, topsoil has just washed away and, and bled into the ocean, leaving only this impervious hard pan surface and very deep gullies. Uh, and then during the, um, the day after the Pearl Harbor was bombed, 
uh, December 8th, then um, 1941 martial law was declared and the island came under the control of the US Navy. Throughout World War II and throughout through 1990, the island was used for live fire military exercises. This on the top left shows uh, large targets that were made on the island made of uh, tires painted white. And these were ship to shore targets for uh, ships that would come and shell the island from, from the ocean. And then on the bottom right is the most extreme live fire test. Three, three live fire tests of, of 500 tons of TNT were blasted to simulate the, an atomic bomb blast and to uh, see what the impact would be on communications on ships anchored nearby and the impact on the, the ships. So the island uh, came into our, our, our current consciousness, the consciousness of my generation of Native Hawaiians and, uh, and people throughout the islands. When Charles Maxwell shown here, the president of the Aloha organization, which stood for Aboriginal lands of Hawaiian ancestry, put out the call to occupy federal land. And in this case, he decided to go with occupation of Koho'olawe um, in an attempt to bring focus nationally to a bill that Aloha organization had introduced into Congress for reparations to Native Hawaiians to be made by the US Congress in acknowledgement of the illegal role that the US government played and its agents in Hawaii played in the overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy. And so to bring attention to this bill uh, for reparations to Native Hawaiians, he felt we needed to have an occupation. In his words, we needed our own wounded knee, which was had brought national attention to the Native American Indian uh, rights and claims. And so the call went out to occupy Koholabe, and those who answered came on landed uh, one boat, you know, there was a blockade that the Coast Guard put up, only one boat made it through with nine people uh, who became known as the Koholabe Nine, and they made their first landing at Kuhei'ia on January 6, 1976, uh, 45 years ago. And this is stage one in the um, this began or ignited uh, the stage one in the uh, reclamation of Koholabe and, and its elevation again as the sacred island it had once been by, uh, uh, as honored by our ancestors as the Kohe Malamalamo Kanaloa, the shining birth canal of Kanaloa. Uh, so there were um, uh, the one, uh, George Helm left early. There were uh, six others that were picked up and then two, Walter Ritty and Emmett Aluli stayed behind and they uh, wandered for two days before they were arrested. Stage two then became um, a period of organizing and outreach and direct action. And there were occupations and there were arrests and there were court cases and there were educational rallies throughout every single island. Um, the, the rallying call became Aloha Aina, as they're saying, Aloha Aina is the calling of our kupuna for creation, not desecration, proper use, not gross misuse, respect of the land, not abuse of land, self-sufficiency, not false dependency, living heritage, not a museum heritage, a pu'uhonua, not an off-limits area, caretakers, not owners of this Aina, Hawaii, take only what you need for today, not take and and, and to reach the past to learn the, the many others values, which sustained over 300,000 Hawaii people in harmony with nature. The, um, the whole movement suffered a setback um, with the um, disappearance um, and loss of George Helm and Kimo Mitchell at sea in March uh, of 1977. March uh, seven and nine is what the families placed on the plaques in 1987 and they were never found and their disappearance is still a mystery. But um, in the period of the, in this period that followed, there was now a period of litigation against the Navy and court cases. Um, one civil suit, Aluli versus Brown. Uh, Brown was the Secretary of Defense at the time. 
And um, this civil suit became important in eventually giving access to the Protekalavi Ohana to the island. But in the intervening period, the military started to allow um, the Protekalavi Ohana to visit the island and to bring uh, the, the, the Ohana decided to bring Kupuna to walk the island and identify the sites that they were familiar with and to share their mana'o and to share the mo'olelo, the history of these places of importance on the island and to share oli and chants uh, and to explain the place names and reveal these place names and their meaning. And so the left, you have the landing of um, Auntie Emma de Vries, accompanied by Kavai uh, Kapu Hewitt. On the bottom, you can see Uncle Harry Mitchell uh, talking to a group of students uh, there at the Aie um, Fishing Koa in Hakio Ava. This is the Aie Fishing Koa, one of the sites that our kupuna identified. And our Mo'olelo speaks of how when Ai began the, the tradition of the Kula practices and fishing shrines uh, out of um, Hamoa in Hana, he traveled uh, then to uh, Kipuhulu and Kaupo, and then he came to Hakiwava at Koholawe and established a fishing koa there. And our kupuna identified this koa as that fishing shrine. Kupuna also identified in these um, visits a second visit to the island legally with the Ohana. Uh, this is a compass rock and it's a, the, the compass rock is in, there's a line that goes this, this line here between the rocks. So there's one, two, three, um, one, two, three, four rocks. And the line that runs this way from the ocean in is true, marks true west east. And the line that runs between these pohaku marks tr tr true north south. And um, again, uh, our, um, Homer Hayes knew of this feature and came to look for it and help dis discover it with the Ohana. Uh, and as our chant from Uncle um, Harry spoke of this pohaku ahu aikupele kapili o ke ave iki, which was part of a navigation school, uh, in this case under ke ave iki, for the kahuna um, uh, ki uh, kilo, uh, kilo pai honua, those who studied the universe and the movement of universal life, you know, the, the stars and such. Um, Sam Lono knew of a navigator's chair up at Pu'u Moa Ula Iki, and he sent his uh, haumana to discover this chair. This is one view and a close-up view of that chair. And then we entered into uh, stage three um, because the civil suit yielded a mandate from the court of for a consent decree and joint governance uh, between of the island between the protect Koholawe Ohana and the military. And so in this stage, uh, the, um, uh, the civil, it said that as a, both in practice and at a, as a matter of judicially protected law, the protect Koholawe Ohana, without reference to either the state of Hawaii or the county of Maui, exercise shared governance responsibility with the US Navy over the island from 1980 until 2003 when the United States Navy retained um, that had retained control of access to Kaho'olawe turned over that access uh, a control of access to the state of Hawaii with which Stanton will speak about next. So for um, a, a, a period of 23 years from December 1st, 1980, when the consent decree went into effect until November 11th, 2003, the, um, the consent decree providing access to the protect Kaho'olawe Ohana was in force. And in this period now of joint governance and joint use, um, we brought um, thousands of people from all over the islands, from Hawaii to Kauai, families, communities, students, and teachers to come and visit the island, to experience the island, to live on the island as Hawaiians, to practice our Native Hawaiian cultural practices. And one of the important um, uh, developments in this period of time, one of the first important practices that was revived was the ceremony of the makahiki on Koho'olawe, which had not been 
uh, openly and publicly practiced since the Ainoa in, um, in November or in October of 1819. And under the guidance of the Edith Kanaka Ole Foundation and to Edith Kanaka Ole and Nalani Kanaka Ole, uh, the, the Ohana uh, has begun to, um, has started to, started in January of 1982 to close the 1981-82 season of Makahiki. And it will be 35 years that we will have um, honored Makahiki. And uh, in this, we call upon Lono to bring this long cloud that you see here and to bring the soft, gentle rains that will help nourish the land so that the plants can revive and, and, be, and live. We also, as part of our cultural practices, built and dedicated a pahula. At that time, it was, I think, the fourth to have been built in modern times, dedicated by Hokulani Ho Padilla and um, Halau Pau Hiiaka. But it was during the Makihi season in November of 1987 that we dedicated it. And you can see Uncle Harry Mitchell Bear, Hokulani Ho in the uh, gray, and also um, Kulani Kanaka Ole Kanaheli also helped to dedicate it as well. Uh, we also opened ceremonies to uh, Kanaloa, the god of the ocean, calling upon him to help us slip away the Navy and all of the abuse by the Navy of the island. And we reached stage four in October 22, 1990. We won victory and we did stop the abuse of the island. And so the years of Aloha Aina practice uh, and prayer uh, finally led and our perseverance in our, in our belief and our practice and our caring and love for the land, our dedication and commitment to stop the military abuse um, was finally uh, uh, paid off and finally rewarded with stopping the bombing. And uh, I'm turning it over now to Stanton Inamoto who will pick up the story of how the bombing came to be stopped. Aloha. Oh, mahalo, Davey. Um, let's see, I'm going to try and share my screen um, and start my, uh, oops, let's see, start my remarks. Um, okay, oh, sorry, I call it my, um, so um, mahalo everyone, aloha mai kako. Um, I'm Stanton Enomoto. Um before I, I, I kind of begin my portion of the program, I just kind of want to give a quick disclaimer in that um, I know Brianna in her introductions um, referenced my current employment with uh, the Office of Native Hawaiian Relations within the Department of Interior. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge that, you know, my uh, remarks this evening are, you know, go back to my time and my relationship with Koholawe. So in the early 1990s up into the early 2000s. So well before my current employment. So I just didn't want people to misconstrue um, anything that I'm saying as a reflection of the current position of the United States government or the Department of the Interior or my office. So with that, um, let me jump into this. Um, I also want to aloha all the folks that are um, participating on the call. I had the chance to scroll through the participant list. I saw a lot of old friends, a lot of family. So thank you very much for taking your time to, to engage in this conversation tonight. So um, picking up where uh, Daviana left off, um, kind of that time in 1990. Um, it was really a, a very pivotal seven months. Um, a lot of it was um, in some respects catalyzed by the passing of Senator Spark Matsunaga on April 15th. But as Davey mentioned, there was this groundswell of movement prior to that. His passing um, created this space in which uh, a month later, Governor Waihei was uh, able to appoint uh, then Congressman uh, Daniel Kaka into the Senate. Um, and that triggered a response a few weeks later by Congressman Pat Saiki 
to announce her run for that the Senate seat. So 1990, it was midterm elections um, in the Bush administration. Um, so there was a lot of electoral dynamics going on. And again, in the 1990s, think about everything that was going on in the Hawaiian community, whether it was, you know, 1988 at Honokahua with the burials or other things happening, there was a lot of energy around Native Hawaiian issues. So feeling that energy, um, Senator Akaka then introduces a bill into Congress, Senate 3088, calling for a study commission that would look at the cessation of military activities on Kaho'olawe and the eventual return of the island to the state. <coughs> Excuse me. So he introduced that bill. Um, a few weeks later, the Defense Department of Defense Appropriations Bill started moving through the House, um, HR 5803. Um, and there was this idea of potentially connecting Senator Akaka's ideas in his Senate bill, which did not advance in the Senate, and trying to move it as an amendment into the House resolution. Um, a couple of weeks later, October 22nd, as Davey mentioned earlier, President Bush issues his memoranda to Secretary of Defense Cheney at the time to immediately discontinue, discontinue use of Koho'olawe as a weapons range. So that was very clear, very directive. It was through the executive branch. It wasn't through Congress. Um, but meanwhile, through Congress, um, that idea of introducing an amendment into the DOD Appropriations Acts was moving through. And eventually it became law uh, President Bush signed it into law as um, Public Law 101-511, and there's specific sections, uh, as, as I noted there, 8118 and 8119. It provided, it directed the Navy to provide funding to um, the establishment of this Kaho'olawe Island Conveyance Commission, which I'll, I'll touch on in a second, as well as it continued this idea that was in the president's memo of discontinuation, discontinuation of military use of Kaho'olawe. So it's not only the executive, but you have the Congress saying, you can't do anything more uh, military uses and bombing, et cetera, on Kaho'olawe. And then, you know, November 6th, the very next day, uh, the midterm election, Senator Akaka wins that election for the Senate. So he retained the seat that he was appointed to from uh, by Governor Waihe after Senator Matsunaga passed away. So um, with that um, 1991 Department of Defense Appropriations Act uh, legislation, it established the Koho'olawe Island Conveyance Commission and they functioned for three years, more or less, um, to look at exactly that, the, the conveyance and the return of the island back to the state of Hawaii. What would that look like? So it was a five member commission. It was chaired by former Maui County Mayor Hannibal Tavares. Emmett Aluli was vice chair. They had a five member staff, uh, a $1.5 million budget, which allowed them then to contract about 22 studies on a variety of, of issues, whether it was the legal setting, cultural natural resources, um, the history of the island that Davy, you know, characterized earlier, key place names, and then digging into, you know, what is the unexploded ordinance hazards that exist on the island. What does that look like? What is it gonna to take to clean it up? They had a series of public hearings throughout the state. Um, folks on, on the call may have even participated in those. Um, it all culminate, culminated in a final report to Congress, which I have the cover of here um, in March of 1993. 
Um, some of the key takeaways in that final report were, you know, it was important that title, the deed title, the fee title to the island be conveyed back to the state of Hawaii uh, from the United States. And I, I, I should note just kind of a historical mention, 1953, President Eisenhower took title of the island under executive order um, and conveyed that, that title to um, the United States Navy. So under martial law, after World War II, the military had control of Koholawe, but it was in 1953 with um, President Eisenhower's executive order that actual fee title to the land and usage for military purposes was actually conveyed. So um, the recommendations from the conveyance commission was to um, restore the island back to the state. And there's provisions within the executive order that provided for that. Um, another key recommendation there in the, the conveyance commission report was the United States is responsible. Obviously they took title to the island, they bombed the island for decades. Um, therefore they should be held responsible for the cleanup and eventual uh, environmental restoration of the island. Um, and another key point, and, and I'll touch to this in, in other slides, is that there was a recognized need for special federal legis legislation to be established to, to do those things. Because at the time, um, existing environmental regulations, Department of Defense regulations, if they had to, if Koho Olave had to go through that process, um, we'd prove, <laughs> today we'd still probably be um, debating various aspects of it. So it was, it was deemed, you know, we have a window of time, we can get special legislation through, we can get funding and let's kind of do this. Um, recognizing that it was also important that control of access to the island um, be retained with the Navy or the United States to do the cleanup. So while conveyance of title could happen, control of access and what happened on the island would be retained by the United States. Um, and then lastly, it was also recognized that there was no existing department within state government to actually handle all of these uh, responsibilities. So let's create a new state agency to do that. So those were the, the big outputs out of um, the, the Conveyance Commission. And then on the federal side, you know, this is all 1990 to 1993. There was uh, Governor Waihe'e and his staff were very key in um, seeing that opportunity and trying to move legislation through on the federal side as those recommendations were being developed by the Conveyance Commission. So things were running in parallel, not just on the, faith, the federal side, but on the state side. And I'll touch on that in a second. Um, but on the federal side, um, Senator Inouye was uh, chairman of the subcommittee on defense appropriations. So he was in a very um, essential or critical position to advance legislation uh, and funding with respect to the military for Hawaii. And so it was, it was strategized that, you know, his committee would be the vehicle under which this Title X um, appropriations language would be advanced. So um, in the House, uh, September, uh, 1993, the DOD Appropriations Act language was introduced. Um, a month later, Senator Inouye introduced an amendment as it advanced to the Senate side that included um, a number of provisions for the conveyance and cleanup of Koholawe, and I'll touch on that in a second. And it moved through the Senate, given his um, 
ability to influence um, his colleagues, and it was moved by voice vote. So it's kind of almost by unanimous consent. And it eventually was enacted a few weeks later uh, by President Clinton. I mean, the appropriations bill is gigantic, and this was just one small provision within that Appropriations Act. But the, the, the architect of that special legislation for uh, the conveyance, the cleanup, the cooperation between the state and the Navy uh, for 10 years was the, the man you see there in the bottom right, um, just to the left of Emmett Aluli. Uh, his name is Neil Proto. He was a former um, Department of Justice, uh, Deputy Attorney General, very skilled, very knowledgeable in the workings of, of legislation. Um, he had a relationship with Governor Wahe'e and others and came out to Kaho'olawe and was not only touched by the physical space of the island, but all of those that were involved. And he saw or took on the Kuleana to draft that legislation. So in the legislation, and this is the key thing that I think we all hung by when I was there and Mike continues to hang by is, you know, it's this recognition of the island's cultural and religious significance. And through that, he um, drafted language that specified that the Navy needed to convey the island to the state within 180 days. It was key because if conveyance didn't occur first, then it was likely the Navy would never con convey the island for various reasons. So conveyance had to happen, but it was understood that in order to do the cleanup, which the Navy would be responsible for, they had to have control of access. So that provision was written in there. Um, it was also very key that the Navy and the state had to coordinate during this period of the cleanup. Um, and as I touched on earlier with this whole notion of special legislation, um, Neil wrote in specific exemptions to CERCLA, or, uh, you know, the EPA's Superfund law um, so that the cleanup could occur within this 10 year period um, efficiently. And as an alternative, he created this process to develop an alternative regulatory framework, not only on the environmental side, but on historic preservation and, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, the legislation itself, and this is through Senator Inouye and his, his staff was able to provide 400 million um, for the cleanup over 10 years and a, a carve out of about 11% for the state for ongoing management and future management of the reserve. Um, and another key aspect of the of Title 10 was that it um, ensured that the United States would retain responsibility for environmental cleanup and unexploded ordinance after that 10 year period. So it's not as though it was all gonna be dumped on the state of Hawaii. The United States would continue and, and does continue to retain that responsibility. And as Davy touched on earlier about the 1980 consent decree, this legislation recognized that and continue um, Congress or it made Congress acknowledge the rights of the Ohana to continue to access the island under the consent decree. So this was a very key um, part of federal legislation. While the federal legislation was going on, the state legislation again was moving in parallel fashion. So 1993 legislative session, a bill started moving through to establish the Koho'olawe Island Reserve, as well as the commission to administer the, the reserve. So it passed through session. Um, it was signed into law by Governor Waihe'e in June. A um, Couple key provisions I just wanted to call out in the statute. So section 6K2, um, 
defines the island reserve. So it's not just the island, but it's the two miles of water around it. Um, the, the statute is also very, very clear about the kinds of uses that could occur on the island or within the reserve. And those include, you know, as you see, traditional customary practices, preservation of historic and cultural sites, environmental restoration, you know, native plants, et cetera, erosion control, what have you, and education. Um, it's also made very clear that commercial uses are strictly prohibited. So the, the sacred nature of the island and the reserve as Davy described are preserved uh, or not corrupted, if you will, by commercial uses. Um, it also laid out um, the nature of the commission. So in uh, one seat goes to the deal on our chair or the chair designee. Similarly, another seat goes to the office of Hawaiian affairs or the, the chair or their designee, uh, a representative of Maui County, um, three representatives of the Protecto La Viohana as uh, approved by the governor and one member of a native Hawaiian organization, again, as approved by the governor. So it's a seven member body. Um, they're charged with a number of authorities and responsibilities, et cetera. One of which I just kind of wanted to point out because I'll touch on it in, in later. Um, is that it gives the commission the authority to enter into stewardship agreements with native Hawaiian organizations that have um, cultural expertise or um, you know, certain skill sets that contribute to the restoration of the island. Um, another key provision, again, this is 1993, uh, June 1993, in January, it, there was a huge commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the overthrow of the kingdom. A lot of energy, a lot of movement around um, native Hawaiian sovereignty at the time. So there was a provision and the first of its kind, and I think maybe the only of its kind in state statute that it provides for the transfer of the island and the reserve to a sovereign native Hawaiian entity upon recognition by the United States and the state of Hawaii. So this is, this was huge at the time. Well, it still is huge um, and it's still preserved in law. So um, yeah, the legislature and the advocacy and, and whatnot that created this um, was, was really, really important. It's kind of a, well, more of a footnote. Um, as statutes created, there's administrative rules that in, implement statute. So in August, 1994, emergency rules were adopted um, by the Kohoolawe Island Reserve Commission to effectuate certain responsibilities there. And then it was later replaced in 2002. So kind of moving on, um, Part of Title 10, again, required the conveyance of the island to the state of Hawaii. So key, May 7th, 1994, signing ceremony of the deed, the actual conveyance of Ko'olawe from the federal government to the state of Hawaii occurred. Uh, the quick claim deed was signed out at Palauea uh, on Maui. There's a, it included a number of the clauses that were in the federal legislation. It acknowledged the Navy state cooperation in development of an MOU. Um, the deed preserves the right of the United States to access the island to remove unexploded ordinance. And then the deed makes binding on any third party um, that may receive title to the island that they have to comply with those conditions. So let's see, moving on. Talking about the, the MOU, again, all of these things were moving in parallel um, over this period of 93, 94. Um, 
it required that the Navy and the state enter into a memorandum of understanding or MOU to uh, look to this 10 year period, 1993 to 2003, how are things gonna occur? So there was the Navy, there was a state and the Koholawe Island Reserve Commissioner Kirk was acting on behalf of the state. So the MOU provided the terms and conditions for the cleanup, control of access, uses on the island. It specified a number of sub-agreements or documents that needed to be um, uh, completed or negotiated in order for everything to follow through. Kind of the two key things you see in the picture there below you um, on the left is the state was responsible for developing a use plan for the island, which identified habitation areas, restoration areas, et cetera. And then based on that state use plan, uh, the Navy would then in turn develop a cleanup plan, which would more or less try to meet those needs. Um, and there were, again, a number of sub agreements to that. Um, so the use plan was completed in 95. The Navy started its process of developing its cleanup plan after that. Um, meanwhile, the Koholawe Island Reserve Commission and the Navy were in negotiation to develop this unique regulatory framework that would serve the cleanup. I mean, given uh, the waiver from Superfund laws, we had to create uh, a new structure under which we could conduct the cleanup efficiently. Um, with that, we also had uh, dispute resolution provisions as well as public participation um, uh, provisions or an agreement. So all of that stuff was negotiated within uh, one to two year time span. And I was part of those negotiations. And, you know, while those negotiations were ongoing, the Navy, um, because it had never conducted an unexploded cleanup or ordinance cleanup of this magnitude, um, initiated sort of a model or a test of how do we, how do we utilize our equipment? How do we engage work crews? How do we mobilize to an island that doesn't have an airport kind of thing. All of these things had to be considered. So the Navy initiated a model cleanup on about 230 acres on the island. Um, and then the learning from that would inform their bigger solicitation or what was called the omnibus um, cleanup solicitation, 1996 and eventually awarded 1997. Um, also going on at the state side in those years, the, the Kirk was developing its own environmental restoration plan for the island, its, manage, its plans for managing the oceans, also incorporating all of the things that Davy said about the cultural significance of the island, the Vahipanda, how, how, how do we do that? And so the commission, started developing a cultural use plan. Um, one kind of culmination of all that was in 1997, we conducted a restoration ceremony at Pu'u Mohoi on Maui and some of the photographs you see there, there was the ahu on the left on Maui, the ahu in, you know, to the right of that is on Koho'olawe, uh, Keone Fairbanks, our executor, executive director at the time served as the MC. And we were able to get, you know, key dignitaries. And the contractor was there, the Navy was there, Senator Inoy was there. And it was really the, the brainchild of Auntie Frenchie. She, she drove this thing to happen. And it really set off um, the cleanup and, uh, of the island. So with the cleanup itself, a two tier standard surface clearance, and then a tier two subsurface clearance that went down to about four feet or so below grade. Under the MOU, it was required that the Navy clear 100% of the island, uh, surface clearance tier two, 25% of the island with an additional 5% for Rose Trail. The contract was eventually awarded 
to Parsons UXB joint venture for about 280 million. Um, and at the time, this was the largest cleanup or unexploded ordnance cleanup in US history. Um, to do the work, the, the Navy and the contractor decided to divide the island up into grids, 100 meter by 100 meter, hect one hectare grids, and there's about 11,000 of those. So every day, 400 plus workers flew by helicopter to the island to do the cleanup in one of these grids in various stages. So it required very specialized teams. Some did survey, archeological research, biological research. Others were there to cut vegetation. Others were there to you know, remove ordnance. So it was, it was uh, highly specialized and required a high level of degree of coordination between the Navy, the, the contractor, and, and the Kirk. And, you know, here we had uh, on the bottom right, our own, you know, office, our own hut on island. We also had offices on Maui and offices at Pearl Harbor um, to assist. So it was highly integrated during the cleanup. So this is just- Hi Stanton, I'm so sorry to interject. I just wanted to um, let our folks know that we are gonna run a little over time for the program. Okay. Um, so no rush at all, but I just wanted to make our audience aware of that. And okay. thank you so much, so much to be covered. I know, I know we should have allocated so much more time for this. Yeah, and, and yeah, a call of my, for, for those on the call. Yeah, I'm trying to get through this as quickly because we certainly want to have time for Q and A, but I, I just wanted to, yeah, I'll, I'll continue on any case. So the island was divided up into various work areas and what you might see as pixels are each of those grids. So there's about, yeah, 11,000 of them. Um, there were a number of challenges during the course of the cleanup. Um, how do we protect archeological sites when you find ordinance um, that is unsafe to move and you need to blow it up in place? So what you see down on the bottom left is you know the the wall of tires i mean everyone was learning as they were going i think that excavation pit that you see there this is up near the summit of the island luomatika and right across the road uh was a historic site it was a, a i think a fishing shrine if i'm not mistaken and in that hole was probably about a 250 pound bomb so how do they detonate the bomb because it's unsafe to move and still protect the archaeological site. So things like tires were seen as a means of absorbing that explosive impact. And then the picture you see in the middle is another example. This is um, right near our base camp. So the distance between the, the blast on the right and the structures you see on the left, I want to say is about maybe 300 yards or so, so a thousand feet. It's not that much. And the things you see flying up in the air are those protective works, they're tires. So we, you know, working with the Navy, we tried to do what we could to minimize impact and protect cultural sites. Another thing was solid and hazardous waste management. This is in the middle of the island during the Navy's cleanup years, they, for better or for worse, just dump stuff um, in gullies as a means of either erosion control and waste disposal. So how did we have to reconcile all of this stuff? Uh, there are questions at the time to save costs. Well, let's just cover it up and we'll, we'll just bury it. Um, and we can continue to blow up bombs. And on our side, we're like, no, that's, not right. You, you need to remove this stuff because it could contribute to further environmental contamination. And eventually that's what occurred. Um, on the environmental restoration side, as I mentioned, these, there were these teams that were doing all of these various activities. One of them was to cut kiave and cut brush in order to get to the clearance. You can't see bombs through grass and kiave trees. So they cut brush and tied them up and flew them by helicopter and dropped them into the piles that you see there in the upper right. 
And that's a small pile, by the way. Some were much, much bigger. And eventually, yeah, they lit them on fire to get rid of the waste. But I think for us, more importantly, was Kiave is incredibly invasive. It drew down groundwater. And if there was an, uh, an opportunity to kill the Kiave um, and preserve or try to enhance the water table, we wanted to do that. And regrettably, that for a variety of reasons was, did not happen. So these are just some of the challenges we encountered along the way. Another big challenge we encountered was around 1999, 2000, Navy informed the state that they're not gonna be able to finish the cleanup as uh, specified in the memorandum of understanding. So 100% surface clearance, 25, 30% subsurface clearance. We just didn't have the time. We're not gonna have the money to get there. So the Navy reached out to us at the time and said, hey, you guys gotta consider maybe reprioritizing what you're doing. So we went through a long deliberation process with the commission and we came to this idea of really the goal of this cleanup is to be able to provide safe and meaningful use of the island. How do we do that? And we do that through a risk management process. And that risk management process is based on three things. One is having sufficient infrastructure like you see there with the road. Another is clearing as much land as we can, obviously reduce the hazard. And thirdly, in the upper right, um, get as much data. We need to understand what the landscape of the island looks like. So that was our strategy. And we persevered through that and we went through a sequencing process, identified areas of, okay, this is what we want for surface, subsurface um, and had various steps for that. Um, eventually what ended up uh, happening by the end of the cleanup period, we got um, 100% assessment of the island. So we got the data across the island and hundreds of new archeological and cultural sites were identified in that process and were mapped and surveyed. Um, additionally, we were able to reduce unexploded ordnance risk in a number of areas. That's kind of the, the brown areas you see um, there, but the Navy was not able to certify that for use. Um, we got uh, a number of areas that were subsurface cleared and a number of areas that were surface cleared. So, and then there were a number of, of areas on the island, mostly on the west and south, uh, that uh, were not cleared. We just had assessment or risk reduction. So this is kind of the map uh, of what it looked like at the end of the cleanup. So as we got closer to the end of the cleanup, it was really how do we start closing things out? How do we, how do we prepare for that transition from Navy to state? Uh, the Kirk went through a process of developing its own management plans, risk management plans, which we completed in 2002. There was legislation um, to establish warning signs and other things on island uh, by the state legislature. We ended up negotiating quite vigorously with the Navy, not only here in Hawaii, but also in Washington, DC on, on that liability exposure. The Navy was obviously trying to reduce their exposure or limit their exposure. Um, in our minds at the time, it was, it was a little too much. And so we pushed back um, and I think we eventually prevailed in the sense that the United States retained, retained responsibility for newly discovered ordinance. And what you see there that, that um, five inch projectile on the bottom that was identified in 2014. I happened to be back on island and we were walking in a previously cleared area. I looked in a gully and there is this thing sticking up. So it, it's just a reminder that ordinance is gonna continue to be exposed um, in these areas. 
Meanwhile, at the state legislature, there were concerns about whether or not the state had the capacity to manage the reserve, and we had to engage the legislature in a number of hearings, which we got ourselves through. Um, and then we were also negotiating with the Navy um, around the demobilization of equipment and transfer of property, buildings, cars, what have you, weed whackers, everything. So the, the, the more the Navy kept on island, it, it saved their costs of demobilization. So there was incentives both ways and we, we had to work that out. Also, along with the MOU and Title 10, the Navy had to certify their cleanup and in that certification, identify areas that were uh, safe to use for certain purposes. Those were legal documents that needed to be filed with the Bureau of Conveyances. So we did that. Um, and then, you know, it all kind of culminated uh, in November uh, 2003. It, ceremony at Iolani Palace marked the end of the cleanup. We went through a process of entering into a letter of understanding for access with the Ohana so they could continue to do what they needed to do. We did our uh, contracts to keep the base camp open on island. And then on April 9, 2004, as you see in the helicopter pictures below, the last helicopter with Navy personnel finally left. Um, and that was, at least for me, an incredible day. Um, so we continued to work on certification. Um, it, the Navy's departure and our state control allowed us to do expand our environmental restoration and environmental management programs, as well as fully implement our risk management plan. So keep people safe and how to come to the island appropriately. And with that, I, I apologize, I, I ran long on my remarks, but so much ground to cover. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mike. So mahalo piha, uh, thank you. Hey, thanks a lot, Stanton. Uh, let me start sharing my screen here, okay. Oh, I have to wait, okay, here we go. Let's, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me get this thing going. Okay, uh, this one, share, and get that thing going. Okay, here we go. So, um, aloha kako, my name is Mike Nahopi. I'm the executive director for the Kaho'olawe Island Reserve Commission. Uh, I've been the director since uh, 2008. Um, and basically, the, as Stanton is talking about, the Kaho'olawe Island Reserve Commission was created as a state entity to receive and manage Kaho'olawe on behalf of the state of Hawaii uh, until such time that a sovereign native Hawaiian entity is recognized by both the state and the federal government and at which time the island and its resources will be conveyed or transferred to that entity. Um, let me see, where is my screen? Okay, so what is the Kirk? So what, what I'm gonna be talking about mostly is what's happening today with Kaho'olawe. Um, the Kirk, the mission of the Kirk is to implement the vision for the island. And um, as was proved by the commission, um, the vision for the island is we see the island as the physical form of Kanaloa, the, the god of the ocean. We see the body form of Kanaloa restored to its pre damaged state. But we also see this restoration as an effort of the people of Hawaii. So it's not a effort that we're going to hire a bunch of workers to go do it, but we want to involve the public and the general, the general, you know, the people of Hawaii to participate in this restoration effort in the effort so that not only are they healing Kaholabe, but they learn how to heal on their own. So, and also um, part of our undertaking is to provide the meaningful safe use of the island. So we provide infrastructure, we provide safety pro programs, and other things to make sure that people who come to Kaholabe have a safe and uh, meaningful visit to the island. And we also fo focus on the restoration of the island on itself. Uh, this is kind of another view of what Stanton was showing you about the cleanup. Um, you can see here on the island, the red areas are all the dangerous areas that were uncleared. So those are areas that we can't go into. 
um, the green areas are the areas that were cleared down to four feet. So those are the majority areas where we can we can dig, we can plant, we can build roads, we can build structures, we can do anything in those areas to dig the soil and do very intensive work in those areas. Everything else on the island is uh, has only been surface cleared, so we can walk in those areas, and but it's a lot of areas, and you see in this photo a lot of those areas have this kind of reddish tint which is the hard pan and one of the things we had to figure out over the years is how do you plant on areas where you can't dig how how do you create vegetation on areas where you can't dig a hole and put a plant in or bury seeds so we've kind of developed new methods of planting uh, in areas that you are not allowed to dig in uh, today the commission is composed as stanto was saying seven members uh, three of the seats are representatives of the Protect Kahoolabe Ohana. Our current chairperson is uh, Joshua Kakua, who is with uh, the, uh, University of Hawaii. Uh, we also have uh, the PKO, um, Jonathan Ching, who will be departing this year. And incoming uh, commissioner will be Anella Evans from Lanai. Uh, the other PKO seat is Biki Ala Piskaya, who is from Molokai and uh, works down in Kalaupapa. Uh, our Office of Hawaiian Affairs representative is the chairperson of OHA, uh, Hulu Lindsay. Um, our Maui County official is Salmalu uh, Mata'afa, who is with the Department of Planning or the Department of uh, Infrastructure, I believe. Uh, we also have a seat for the chairperson of the Department of Land Natural Resources, Suzanne Case. And then our representative for Native Hawaiian Organization uh, departing is Kumuhula Hokolani Holt who will be departing in June and incoming will be Dr. Benton Pang from the Department of, of well, from the Fish and Wildlife Services, uh, who specialized in Native Hawaiian dryland restoration as his dissertation thesis. Um, we managed the island today with a staff of 14. Uh, at one time, it was a lot higher, but um, I'll show you some uh, slides about the fiscal status of the Kirk. But we are divided into uh, various programs. We have an administrative program, reserve operations, which is all the field operations that support our specialty programs. We have three specialty programs, our ocean management, our restoration program, and our cultural program. We lost two positions uh, last year due to um, statewide vacancy elimination for all state governments. And uh, we were actually survived this legislative session we were up for two more cuts as part of the program review, uh, statewide program review of 20% reduction for all state agencies, but we kind of came out okay. So we, we kept 14 people for the next uh, two years. And this graph is something that uh, Stanton wanted me to show you. Uh, in purple is the balance of the trust fund. So at one time, the trust fund at 2004 was about $33 million. Um, 2004 was the last time a federal appropriation was placed into the trust fund. The Kirk operated um, for its entire duration on the balance of the trust fund. So from 2004 until 2016, there was no money coming in from any appropriations and the trust fund quickly diminished all the way down to about 2016, which is the next slide. And you see here that for uh, it wasn't until 2016 we finally got funding from the state um, under uh, receiving general appropriation funds in the state budget. So for the last, uh, since 2016, we have been funded by the state for our personnel and some of our operating costs, but we're still using portions of the trust fund for continuing our field operations. Um, a lot of the work is uh, very difficult and Kahoolawe is a very remote and uh, arduous place to work. So there is a lot of wear and tear on the equipment, on the people and the supplies that we need to get out the island to make sure that the work we do out there is safe. What are we doing on the island? Well, our biggest focus is restoration and management of the resources of the island. Uh, our restoration program, its function is to uh, focus on native plants and wildlife restoration. Uh, the biggest areas there are native outplantings. Uh, so far, uh, this is at the end of fiscal year 20, which is last year, we planted close to half a million plants into the ground. Uh, one of our other big 
project is erosion control. As we try to put these plants in the ground, we have to try to stabilize the soil loss. Um, at one time, there was estimated almost a million, um, million cubic feet of soil was being lost a year due to erosion. Uh, there has been projections of up to 17 feet in areas of topsoil that has been run off that has, uh, due to wind and rain erosion, has been blown off the island. Our ocean management program focuses on protecting our resources of the reef system around the island and manages the fishing stock. Um, the, the surveys that are conducted around the entire state has shown that Kaholawe has the greatest biomass and diversity of any ecosystem reef system in the main Hawaiian islands. Uh, the only place that has more biomass and greater diversity than Kaholawe is the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. So that's um, Kaholawe also, uh, as we theorize, act as a, a uh, nursery for fish to spawn and then to also out-migrate to restock all the depleted areas that are around Maui, uh, Kona, and maybe all the way to the other islands. Our cultural program focuses on preserving our historic properties on the island. Um, at what we have over 2,000 individual archaeological features on the island. The entire island is listed on the National Historic Register. Um, we have also cultural use of the island that the cultural program also um, facilitates. Uh, we facilitate community organizations as they want to come out to the island for cultural events and also create partnerships and internships with Native Hawaiian organizations in order to create the next generation of restoration managers, restoration workers, cultural resource practitioners. Uh, we work with Alulike and Kupu as some of the areas to develop these new interns. Our reserve operation program focuses on the day-to-day -day of getting people and material and supplies to the island. The island is about uh, 17, was it, seven miles across the channel, but to get to the base camp, it's about 25 so miles across. Uh, we have to get every single piece of equipment, every single food prop that we have out to the island via our boat. You see there, that's the Ohua. It's a 40 foot landing craft. We also have to make sure that people as they work on the island and they come and volunteer on the island, they have a safe, secure place to stay, that they have meals provided, that they are protected from the heat, the sun, and the unexploded ordnance that still remains on the island. So we have a very intensive safety program that we work with all visitors to the island and even train a lot of the Ohana members on how to uh, safely recognize and avoid unexploded ordnance. Some of our infrastructure we tried to improve over the years. We've completed a, um, a complete photovoltaic grid for our base camp operations. We are currently only using solar power and batteries. Uh, we use some diesel fuel just to drive the trucks around and some gasoline for vehicles. But hopefully one of these days we'll be able to expand our PV field and uh, get more electric vehicles on the island. We do have one electric um, Polaris on the island that we use. Uh, we run an inner island boating operation. We're probably the only state agency that does a regular run uh, between the islands with, for cargo and for people. And the safety program that has been developed for Kahoalabe has been recognized by the Navy as uh, one of the better uh, safety programs in the nation for unexploded ordnance. And lastly, our administration functions, you know, as a state agency, we still have to function um, as a normal government agency. So we have HR issues, fiscal, technology, infrastructure. Uh, we have uh, data connections that we have to maintain with the island. We have a very robust volunteer and outreach program that we utilize uh, to bring volunteers to the island. Uh, we do outreach community work with different schools for education, for marine education, uh, historical outreach. And we also have a research library that we maintain. Uh, most of the documents that Stanton was talking about um, are available on our website. Um, we have a living library where you can look at different um, photos and uh, through the history of Kahoalabe. And we have a uh, app that is downloadable for free on the, uh, either on the Google Play Store or um, iTunes. It's 
It's the uh, Kaholawe Island Guide, which provides you maps with links to different key features or sites on Kaholawe. Uh, some of our current projects that we're working on uh, this year, we have a uh, we're fund getting funding from the Department of Health for maintaining and expanding some of the native plantings we have in Hakuwalva Valley uh, on the upper slopes of the island. We have funding from the Institute Museum of Library Sciences on a virtual library system that we have. Uh, we're also creating a in-house archives to store a lot of the artifacts that were collected off the island. And that has, we've, we've been collecting from different agencies across the state. Uh, we have received artifacts from the Bailey House Museum, from Fish Museum and some other places, and we're housing them at our facilities on Maui. Uh, we're working with the NOAA uh, to do a marine education grant program that we are uh, partnering with Maui High on a ocean education grant. Uh, we have funding to do some marine debris cleanups at Kanapo, and Cook Foundation of Maui is funding us to uh, get more native plants into the ground on Kahoolawe. Some of the major infrastructure projects that we've done over the years, starting from the upper right, uh, you can see our photovoltaic field that is about 100 kilowatts that provides all the power for base camp. Uh, below that is the conceptual design for our Kahoolawe Education Operations Center to be located at Kihei. Uh, we, have a base, uh, we have a base of operations uh, on Kihei where we keep our boat and we, we're going to be building a nursery. And also this will be our office and a museum and education center where we can house the collections of all the Kaholawe artifacts and exhibits that have been done over the years on Maui for people to visit and to learn more about Kaholawe. We've had a dry land project, um, dry land forest restoration project that was funded by the state. Uh, you can see in the lower picture. And then the last project that we completed a few years back was a polycarbonate shelter building down in Hakuawa to replace um, uh, this old um, plastic tarp that was being used by the Ohana for their base camp down there. So now they have a new polycarbonate building down there. And lastly, um, something that all three of us have worked together, um, Daviana, myself, and Stanton, is on the last strategic plan that we developed called Iola Kanaloa. Iola Kanaloa looks at um, the year 2026, which is not that far away. Um, in 50 years since the first landing on Kaholawe in 1976, what do we envision Kaholawe to be after 50 years of Hawaiian occupation? So as part of this strategic plan, we've developed eight program areas um, as the eight arms of the He'e, which is Kanaloa. And as each of these functional programs, we are looking at different projects that meet those um, goals of Iola Kanaloa, restoring and conserving the natural environment, looking at programs to establish more learning and observations about the island, preserving the history of Kaholawe through a digital or archives, uh, creating sustainable shelters on the island, facilities, so our PB system, our dry land CIP water res resource programs, our uwala patches for growing food on the island. How do we maintain cultural sites, customs, and traditions? Uh, how do we expand awareness and access and experiences for people on the island? How do we provide sanctuaries for dialogue, well-being, and for healing? And then lastly, establishing Kanaloa's role through the transition, the transition being the transition of uh, to a Native Hawaiian sovereign entity. So these are the things that the Kirk are doing today. Um, we still have a lot more to move forward, and I'll keep mine nice and short, and I'll... Um, disconnect from the slideshow and we can go to Q&A. Uh, give me a few seconds while my thing, there we go. Mahalo Mike. Um, I encourage our presenters to come on so we can all be here. Wow. So, so much great information was just shared. And I, I like feel like this is such an honor and privilege to have the three of your minds in one space. Um, so I just wanna really get to the chase. We have um, some fabulous questions that have come in. 
Uh, I want to start with Mike real quick, just segueing off of your presentation. You talk a lot uh, about a, a lot of the wonderful um, programs that Kirk has going. And um, of course, Davion and Stanton, please feel free to uh, add your insight into this as well. But first, Mike, what are the biggest challenges still present in caring for Koho Olave? And what is being done or should be done to mitigate these problems? Well, one of our biggest challenges is still the unexploded ordinance. You know, you know, always unexploded ordinance has really tailored the way we manage the island and um, manage the way we do restoration. In, in in a normal restoration effort, you just go out there, you start planting things in the ground, and you just keep moving. You know, like uh, what they're doing on Hawaii Island, planting koa trees, you just keep poking holes in the ground, putting things in there. We have to be aware of where we're planting, and even in the areas where um, we, we can't dig holes in the ground. We've created uh, new techniques to build soil from the wind. So we've created these uh, rock mounds where we just lay, we have a lot of rocks on Kaholabi. So we lay rocks out on the hard pan. And after a month, the wind has blown enough dirt to bury the rocks. And then now it creates this um, mound of clean soil that we know there's no bombs. So we can plant in those areas uh, water is always gonna be a difficult. We are in the lee of Hawaii Island. Um, we have been going through droughts for the last 10 years probably. We probably get about 18 inches of rain on the top of the island and we're down to eight inches on the coastline. So our restoration effort is gonna be like that. Um, remote area, we're very, you know, just getting the Kahoa Lobby, minimal infrastructure. So, and last one is gonna be funding. Um, we have, we were lucky in the early days to have the trust fund, but you know we were, I think that was over 20 something years uh, depending on the trust fund. Um, now we are slowly recovering from uh, the state, uh, two state recessions. Uh, the biggest one when I first got there in 08, which was the uh, post um, real estate market. And now this is the post uh, uh, COVID-19 recession. So um, it's gonna be funding. Uh, David, you got David or Santin? You guys got anything else? Or? Well, well, for us as the Protect Lobby Ohana, it's continuing to expand the recognition of Kahol Lobby as a very sacred place and as a center for cultural learning and practices uh, in in Hawaii, of Hawaiian cultural practices. And so that recognition and that respect and reverence for the island is really important. And so that's why it's important that we, you know, we we maintain that there be no commercial use of the island. That's been, a, that's been a challenge. And how do we generate revenue for the island through maybe learning and cultural activities, um, but that, that's not commercial use of the island. So that's been a challenge for us to have uh, education be one of the centerpieces of the activities on the island and um, and continuing to expand that respect for the island as a sacred place of Kanaloa. Yeah, I, <laughs> Davey and Mike, you guys, you guys hit all the main point. I guess the the, <laughs> the, on, the only other thing that I, I I I would add, you know, it goes back to Mike's last last slide about this uh, the plan we all worked on, Iola Kanaloa, and you know it it really embraces the idea of Kaho'olawe for our Lahui as being that place where we can come into a neutral space and have the kinds of conversations that we, we need to have, you know, and, and it be a safe space. So it's an opportunity. And, you know, I, in the, the eight priorities that Mike mentioned, you know, it's one of the the last couple of them, but I, I think it's worth acknowledging that where we are in this time as Native Hawaiians, that Kaho'olawe can be that space where we can talk openly with one another and we can kind of let go of whatever agenda we have. And we, yeah, the island, the island helps us with that. And, and, and that's the power of Kaolavi, I think. It, it, yeah, it, we have nowhere else to run, you know, and, and we can have these conversations that need to be had. So anyway, that, 
my two cents. Thank you. Um, does Kirk still take the position that it violates no commercial use to allow people who want to assist with, with restoration to pay their own way to the island and for the cost of meals, staffing, mm -hmm. et cetera, for a multi-day stay, for example? Um, if And the they've gone on to ask if there's extensive replant, replanting to be done, wouldn't it be worth testing such a plan. Um, someone else asked if there's a potential opportunity for federal funding to pay for more individuals to do restoration work on the island. Uh, yes. Um, well, right now we, we've already had the determination that um, as, as a state agency, we're allowed to uh, uh, assess a fee um, it's a administrative fee that is not um, by definition a commercial activity. So we do take volunteers on the island and we assess a access fee um, as a government agency as their kind of contribution to their stay on the island, which, you know, it's, um, it has to be administrative in nature. And, you know, there, there's a lot of technical issues about having a fee. So it's not a complete reimbursement uh, or paying their own way, but more of a right of entry kind of type activity, which is not deemed as commercial. Um, we also do seek a lot of uh, federal funding uh, for years. Well, you know, one of, the, one of the challenges we have is that most of the federal funding are uh, distributed by states, you know, to the states. And what is unique about Kaholawe is that we are one of the only state agencies that manages land, water, cultural, um, archaeological. Uh, we have like kind of a, the entire Department of Land and Natural Resource all rolled up into one small agency. And with that, um, because we are focused on one piece of land, um, a lot of the federal funding that comes to the state of Hawaii goes to the bigger state agencies that, um, so we're, we're always in competition and almost with with our other divisions within DLNR trying to get a piece of those funding. An example is like uh, for Monk Seal, most of the Monk Seal funding for Hawaii goes to, uh, goes to the Department of Aquatic Resources, but we have a large population of Monk Seals that, that we also manage on our own. So, so it's trying to um, get determination from the federal government that, that we are uh, a, still a state entity. Like a lot of people don't recognize that we're a state entity, but we're separate from the other state entities. Um, so what are the lessons learned from Koho Olave that should be considered when taking care of other lands in Hawaii, like Waiohole, Waikane, Makua, Pohakuloa, etc.? Well, you know, we were fortunate and there was a convergence of conditions that allowed for Koho Olave to be turned over before the cleanup started. And it was because we had a a democratic governor, John Waihei, who was also native Hawaiian and had been a part of the movement to stop the bombing of the island. We had Senator Daniel Inouye and Akaka and, and uh, Neil Abercrombie in Congress and uh, Patsy Mink, who were all supportive of the island. And we had a democratic president and a democratic majority in the Senate and the House. And William Clinton was very close friends with John Waihei. So we were able and, and, and we, a very senior Senator Daniel Inouye, who was the head of the Military Appropriations Committee. So all of that came to bear in allowing the island to be turned over, as you were saying earlier, May 14th, 1994, before the cleanup started. If the cleanup had been done and the island had not been turned over, we would never get it back. Um, there is a statistic about even after the cleanup was done, well, so now we only have 9% of the island that is clear, cleared to four feet, a depth of four feet, and, you know, 68% is surface, but there's still 20, 23% that's not been cleared at all. And the 68 that's only surface cleared is still dangerous. The island is still dangerous. So I saw some questions about, you know, having people come on their own. You can't go to the island on your own. You have to be escorted because the island is still dangerous unless you know, mm -hmm. you know where the paths are. And people are trained. People are trained to provide that escort. 
to identify where the danger areas are and to avoid those dangerous areas. So that all has to be, um, you know, that's part of the consideration of how, um, how we can bring people to the island and expand its access to the island. But the more that we can, as the Protect Lavi Ohana and uh, Kirk get the resources, then the more we can include volunteers and bring more and more volunteers to experience the island and contribute to its healing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I have two more questions that I'd like to wrap up with. Um, we have an attendee from, from Guam and they've asked, I was wondering what sovereign lands means in the context of Koholawe. Would this be similar to a Native American reservation or would it be Hawaiian independence from the US? What would the path and potential barriers to getting a sovereign entity established be? Sounds like a Stanton <laughs> answer. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking the same. <laughs> oh, we, we got to draw short straws on that one. Um, yeah, again, you know, my disclaimer earlier, I'm not speaking on behalf of given my current employment um, with the, the United States and the Department of Interior. These are, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll try to frame it with respect to my experiences on Koholawe, and I'm not sure I, I, I know how to do that. And, and Davey, I, I, I may end up dumping to you on a lot of this stuff, but it, um, you know, there's, I, I think Hawaii's history um, is, is, is well known over the last hundred years. What happened um, in 1893 or the various events leading up to 1893, um, subsequent events um, with respect to, um, you know, 1900 and the Organic Act and, you know, the, the whole nature of seeded lands. I mean, that, that history is, is known, it's documented um, within our community. There, there may be some debate as to the meaning of those things. And that debate, you know, certainly needs to continue, uh, I think. Uh, and we have, um, well, a few years ago, you know, the pathway to reestablish that relationship, formal relationship between the United States and the Native Hawaiian community has been, you know, as developed. Um, and that was not without controversy and without, you know, debate, et cetera. So a pathway exists now um, as it relates to the territories, um, it's a it's a it's a tricky issue. I mean, I I, I think you know the, the Davis case in Guam is you know exemplifies that. Um, so there's yeah, it's it's a little bit tougher. I mean, I hate to say it, but I I I, I think the territories are in a, a little bit more of a unique situation than we are here. Um, in, in Hawaii. I mean, we all have our challenges and the, the path is long and it's windy and it's crazy, but it's at least, well, in Hawaii, we have a path. Um, I, I, I think it might benefit the, the territories if there's that interest to, yeah, navigate that, that space. I don't know. Uh, Davy, you're you're much more the scholar than I am on this, so I'll throw to you. In our ohana, we follow what Uncle Harry Mitchell uh, advised us when he was still with us, and that is to follow all paths towards sovereignty and independence. So we support uh, we support the effort to that um, where there was a constitutional convention and aha, and both myself and. Um, Emma Luli and Katie Camilla Mello, we were all members of the Ohana participating in that process. Oh, and Uncle Robert Bobby Luai. We uh, support efforts toward independence of Hawaii. We, we want to take whatever path would be open first to uh, whoever re reaches the mountain top first. We want to be there so the island can come back. Thank you, Deviana. So 
I want to ask the final question and um, thank you so much for the participants who have stayed with us for this uh, little extra time. What in each of your opinions is the most ideal or pono future for Ho'olawe and how can this be achieved? And someone um, else has asked if we can, if the state of Hawaii can be trusted in helping to establish these futures moving forward. Mm. Well, I, I answered the question, but I'll, I'll just repeat what it's, you know, our vision, um, we worked with the Edith Kanaka Ole Foundation to give us a cultural vision for the island, a cultural plan for the island, which is uh, a, a process to have everyone who comes with us be trained in cultural practices as Native Hawaiians. But they also saw the island and we're working within the Eola Kanaloa plan that we all worked together. The vision is to establish the island as a, a, a center for mastery in Hawaiian cultural practices because we can practice there without distraction um, and, and or else being photographed and being, you know, like gawked at. It, it's a place where we can, we can practice and master our, 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 our cultural and spiritual um, practices. So that is our vision for the island and to elevate the island again to be recognized as a sacred center for learning. Uh, and there are many other places in the islands too, but Koalabi is, is so unique because it is an island that is disconnected from the other islands. And, you know, I wanted to just add, I had lost my train a little on that other question. The way that we have to uh, protect the other lands, Pohakaloa Makua, is to prevent any expansion. And um, the leases on, on the use of Pohakaloa and Makua are expiring. And we should advocate that those leases not be renewed, I feel very strongly, uh, because it's the more that they use the, uh, and the more intense use of the land for military purposes and the more extensive use, then we will, um, it will lead to never being able to clean up the land and get it back. And we need these lands to be protected. Mahalo, Davey. Stanton or Mike, do you have any closing mana'o you wanna share? Uh, yeah, I don't expand on what David was saying about the um, uh, unexploded ordinance used in the states. Um, you know, having come from uh, having come from the cleanup side of uh, this whole endeavor, um, we were kind of lucky because we on Kaholave we are dealing with mostly World War II and Vietnam era munitions, which are you know e even though they're dangerous, they're fairly simple compared to the type of munitions that you see today. Um, you know, um, I came from a military background. I'm a former Navy officer. Um, some of the some of the briefings I've had about mine warfare and uh, the type of weapon warfare that is in today's um, type of realm are a lot more complex and complicated to deal with than older World War II type missions. You know, so they're a lot more dangerous nowadays, and we're dealing with things like depleted uranium, which you know, we were lucky that we didn't have it on Kaholabi because we we're older. We we're an older military range, and those type of weapons didn't exist at that time. But um, we were, you know, kind of lucky. The, the biggest thing we deal with is lead, you know, lead bullets and um, steel from the bombs. Um, other than that, um, our, our mission with the Kirk is to put it in a better place, put the island in a better place than what we received it. Um, we see our mission, our, our goals is to prepare Kaholabe for whatever future that is going to be, it's going to be its outcome. Uh, we want to try to give it an infrastructure, try to give it um, places where people can live on the island, people can grow food, people can have water sources, you know, those are the key elements of sustainable living. If we can build some of that infrastructure or recreate some of those environmental areas on the island, we're hoping when the Kirk leaves and turns it over to a sovereign entity that it will be in a better condition than what we received it from the Navy. My <laughs> Kai. Right on. I, I, yeah, I just want to maybe add a little more spice on what, <laughs> what Mike and Davey said. And, you know, I, I agree with, with both of your folks' um, comments and 
as, as I was listening to what you were saying, it reminded me of the last slide um, in, in my presentation. Um, and it was a shot uh, on April 10th, 2004, the day after the Navy left, there were a small group of us that <laughs> we tried to get up early enough to make it up to the summit, but we didn't quite get there. So we were at Kalia Lalo and watched the sunrise and you know, it was this realization for those of us that were there that here we are, the island finally came back, you know, from the Navy. We no longer had to ask permission. Um, can I get an escort or a driver to take me to this place? Can I, you know, whatever. We drove the trucks up there on our own. And it was this, this liberation. And, you know, we flew the Hawaiian flag um, in base camp, just the Hawaiian flag, as that kind of acknowledgement or this sense of solidarity of, wow, the island finally came back and it's in Hawaiian hands. Um, and so there was excitement, celebration, all, all the, you know, a, a range of emotions. But I think with that also came this weight of Kuleana. It's like now, okay, we got to do it. We cannot blame the Navy anymore because, you know, we cannot go here, cannot go there. We cannot blame anybody else. It's all up to us. So we, we took it on. I mean, you have to. And, and Mike, David, I mean, you guys know this is what um, self-governance is. And, and it's not always easy. It's not always pretty. It's a lot of work. And I think that's, for me at least, the lesson of Koho Olave uh, after the Navy left was we got to start exercising our muscles around self-governance. And what does that mean for the resources that are there on the island, land, water resources, the vegetation, the archeological sites, um, how we conduct ourselves on the island, who, you know, access control, safety, every, everything. That's what self-governance means. And so I think for me, the big lessons coming out of this is as a Lahui, as, as a community, you know, we've been at this issue for, for decades. And if we wanna advance as, you know, as a Lahui, Kaholave has, <laughs> so many lessons. You put people out there and you're forced to interact. You're forced to get back to basics, what matters, what's important, and how are we going to do things. That's the beauty and uh, of Ohana access, of Kirk access, etc. That's the beauty of the island. So it's how do we make those kinds of experiences um, more whatever, how can we make them happen more often? Because anyway, to me, it gets back to that element of the Eola Kanaloa plan of, yeah, Kaolave is the pico, and that's where this stuff can happen, right? And we just got to be willing to do that as, as, as a lahui. So, you know, whatever it takes to get there, you know, let's go do it. Once you're on the island, the island, the island talks to you. you. You don't have to talk to anybody else. You just, you just listen. And that's what it is. So anyway, sorry, my two cents. <laughs> Mahalo. Thank you, Santin. Yeah, power, powerful words to close on. And thank you, Mike, Diviana, Santin, for the work that you've done and continue to do to protect Koho Olave, to support your community, preserve Hawaiian tradition. I mean, clearly this conversation could go on for so many more hours and for everyone who's attended our nearly two hour discussion thank you this is uh this is going to be shared i know far and wide so i'm i'm like gosh we we captured like every almost every little segment of of this issue and i'm i'm so grateful for your time tonight and for your wisdom again um just really quickly i did want to uh plug an upcoming program from historic kawaii foundation may 24th 
from 5 to 6.30 p.m., they're presenting the virtual film screening of Hawaiian Soul, a narrative short film based on the true story of George Derrett Helm Jr., a leader and artist that used his voice to inspire a revolution of consciousness, who was mentioned earlier. Um, and the film is going to be followed by a panel discussion with the filmmaker and producers, as well as HSF, HHF um, board members, uh, Hawaii State Film Commissioner, the link will be shared in the post event um, email that all of our attendees will get in the next day or two. And we also have a program survey that we would really appreciate your feedback um, if you have the chance to fill out. And with that, wow, I'm, you know, my, my, I'm processing all of this. So, so, so much amazing ground covered tonight. Um, again, I'm so thankful for each of our presenters and I just wish that you all take care um, and thank you with your continued work, your dedication. Um, mahalo and aloha. Mahalo.